Hey guys, welcome to You The Boss Podcast, episode 33. I'm your host, Pam, and today we're going to be talking to Dr. Amanda Sneed. Amanda is a pelvic floor physical therapist at a private practice in Texas. She assists women with childbirth recovery, pelvic pain, and age-related pelvic changes. She is a mother to five amazing kids and a wife to an army veteran. Her house is Ravenclaw and enjoys crafting, traveling, and cooking in her free time. I hope you guys enjoy this talk with Amanda as much as I did. Hey, Amanda. Welcome to You the Boss. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that you are chatting with us today. So, you know, here at You the Boss, we like to dive right in. So give us your name, kind of what you do. Yeah, so I am Dr. Amanda Sneed. I go by Amanda. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist and owner and founder of Health and Healing Physical Therapy, which is a very small pelvic floor physical therapy practice located out in Texas. Woo, Texas. I have to come to Texas. I have to, it's <laughs> it's on my list of places I want to visit. That's so cool. It is an interesting, yes, it's interesting place. <laughs> yes, yes, it is a very interesting place. I couldn't agree more with you there. So how did we get here? How did you get into your profession, what you're doing? Um, was it something you just set out to do or did it kind of just come to you and now you're running with it? Yeah, so I think it helps if I um, clarify what it is that I do as a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, so basically it is a subspecialty of physical therapy. So I am a licensed physical therapist and I specialize in a group of muscles called the pelvic floor. Um, which is basically at the base of the pelvis. And these muscles have a lot of roles with our bladder health, our reproductive health, and our bowel health and um, sexual health as well. So when these muscles are having problems or not working right, um, I typically see patients with issues somewhere in those areas. Um, so that's kind of like what I do. And I kind of first heard about this actually in physical therapy school. It was kind of like a five minute slide on like, hey, this is a thing. Um, but then towards the end of PT school, I ended up getting pregnant with my first baby. Um, and so really like experiencing some things, um, particularly for me, my bladder was so leaky <laughs> with pregnancy. Oh um, and I remember like telling my OBGYN, like, this is happening to me. My back is killing me. And it was just so normalized. Like, yeah, you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had kind of, you know, remembered my like two minute slide or whatever in school and like um, kind of sought some help since I had already had that awareness and was just helped so much. Like I could not believe like there was such easy solutions for the problems that I was having. Um, and it's like, nobody had heard about this. Like what is pelvic floor therapy to this day? 99% um, of people I meet do not know mm -hmm. or have ever heard of it. Um, but it just helped me so much. And so I'm like, I've, I've got to be here. I've got to do this. And that's kind of where, kind of where it all started was just getting that help myself and seeing, you know, what a difference it made for me. Wow. That's so I want to say that I am half part of that 99% who don't know <laughs> um, about what you do, because I've only recently started hearing about it over the last, I'm going to say year. Um, and I think your social media presence has kind of like put me in that, you know, that quote unquote algorithm, because I started to, you know, you know how it'll be like, oh, are you feeling this? Are you mm -hmm. thinking about this? And it's so common, especially amongst women where it's like, oh, yeah, ever since I had kids, like, I can't, I can't hold my pee when I go to the bathroom yes. or like before I go. And I'm like, yeah, like I have a friend of mine who she just had her second baby. Mm -hmm. But after she gave birth to her first, she was like, oh, yeah, I mean, but I couldn't hold my pee before I had my daughter. And I was like, you don't think that's 
yeah. something like you're in your early 30s. Well, what do you mean? Like that's not you haven't had any kind of health condition that would cause you to be this way. Like you just we just kind of accept it. Like, oh yeah, when I laugh, I I go to the bathroom sometimes. And I'm like, what, what? yes. So that's I think absolutely. It's, yeah. I think it's that's like sorry, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> Um, I think it's great that you've taken this, I guess you could say self lesson and made it to something to educate and help other people. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so normalized for all of us. You know, we hear it from our medical providers that we put our trust in to give us help. And we hear Mm -hmm. it from, friends you know so many of my friends would normalize it for me like it's okay girl every that happens to everybody just put on a pad or whatever we hear it from our family members like you know moms or aunts are like yeah that's happened to me and so it's so normalized in our society that it's it's hard to even plant that seed of questioning if that reality is is normal um but it's just goes to show like women's healthcare in the US, I feel like is so underserved. Like we are miles behind where we should be, especially if you compare it to like men's health. There's oh, yeah. so much that we're uncovering. Um, like for example, uh, we didn't even fully understand the clitoris. Like we didn't fully discover the clitoris until 1998, which <laughs> still like blows my mind <laughs> because it's like a major sex organ for women and we have so many clinicians out there that were not trained in doing surgeries without knowing the full anatomy of the female body um and so it's like I just sink my teeth into this now because I just get so fired up um working in these communities that are underserved I think you made such a valid point there and I do just want to say like You always hear the joke that like, you know, half of the time men can't find the clitoris. And it's like, if half of the time that's happening, then how does a doctor who goes to med school to learn the anatomy of the human body, how are they going to find it? And I didn't know that, that it was in 1998 that we made some kind of whatever the leap was. I can't, (laughs) it's, it's funny, but it's not funny because you're right. It's so underserved. Like we are literally, we bring life into the world. Like until we fully figure out how to do this in labs and whatever we, our bodies are literally the vessel. Like there's, I I can't put it in any other form of saying Mm -hmm. we, we get pregnant, we give birth you that I know of you give birth one of two ways and and one of those ways is if you have a c-section and the other way is your vaginal birth so it's like Mm -hmm. how did we not now I have a question this is one question (laughs) leading to another but I have so many questions I do want to ask you know what is the what is the common patient that you see is it someone who has already had a few kids someone who just had a kid for the first time like what does that look like as far as the journey that you see and the different patients that you see on a day-to-day yeah um I would say the most common patient that I have is usually late 30s like um I've had my babies they're getting a little older and I kind of hoped that this issue I'm experiencing would go away by now, but kind of starting to see the symptoms get worse and really questioning, like, what are the next few decades going to be for me? Um, So really, usually there's that fear of like, what's happening to my body? Is this going to get worse? Mm -hmm. Um, Because of course, when we go to our OBGYN, it's kind of like, we're going to watch and see. And when things get bad enough, I will figure out a surgery to offer or medication to put you on. 
the general consensus I'm getting from the community is that it's not feeling cared enough. There's not enough guidance there. Like, I don't want to just pee my pants and then get a bladder surgery. I'd like to be as proactive as possible. Um, so that's probably typically what I see the most. My practice specifically, and, and pelvic floor, pelvic health in general is such a large spectrum, seeing anywhere from you know, pediatric uh, pelvic floor therapy where we have kids that are wetting the bed or kids that are severely constipated to, you know, postmenopausal patients that are really dealing with, you know, what is that hormone change due to our pelvic floors and normal normalizing sexual health there, um, the pregnant mamas, postpartum mamas, and everyone in between. So it's a large scope. Um, I have specifically focused on women's health with this. Um, and really have like a foothold in the bladder health community. So women that don't want to leak and are experiencing um, a condition called pelvic organ prolapse. So when our organs are starting to come down mm -hmm. and we're not wanting to get a bladder sling kind of surgery or some kind of suspension, um, those are who I've kind of focused on the most, but you will find people that, you know, really love working with women during pregnancy and, you know, working with athletes that are experiencing pelvic floor dysfunction. And it's, it's really big once you find your way through the pinhole of mm -hmm. figuring it out. That's, I'm thinking of like so many different things. Like my mind is, if you can imagine like a, a, a pinball machine and like, it's like, bing, bing, bing. like my brain is like all over the place because I know so many people, I know a lot of moms, um, but I know a lot of women who haven't had children that have different issues or, or things that we don't talk about. And, and this is something that I that I want to ask you, um, because I'm sure you've experienced this. But how often do you hear the conversation, whether it's at work or even outside um, of people just saying like, oh, we don't talk about this or like, I don't know what is your your experience with that like how many people um come to you and they're like oh I've never heard of this or it's not something that is talked about around me yeah that's that's huge and actually I think one of the hardest parts of being in the profession is that a lot of it is such a sensitive nature and you know in U.S. culture we are quite conservative and reserved when we talk about um, the health of our genitals, because that's like mm -hmm. a lot of what pelvic floor therapy deals with. And so, I mean, there is a large group of women that just will never even be treated for this because the comfort does not exist with them to even be able to have a voice to say that I am struggling with this. Um, there's some interesting like surveys out there too, where we fi we're finding that providers are not even comfortable with having these conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't really routinely see like a primary care provider asking someone, hey, you know, um, do you pee on yourself on accident? How is your sex life? Are you able to have an orgasm? People are not being routinely asked these questions. So by the people who should be in those spaces and, and be able to start um, gathering that wellness info. So it's so unheard of. Um, it seems like you're the only person in the world experiencing it, but the statistics on women that experience pelvic floor dysfunction is like staggering. It's like 60% of women will at some time in their life be incontinent and that's wow. like more than half of us so I mean people have it but you're not seeing commercials for it um it's been very challenging to promote it on on social media because you know we do have to make sure that the content is is appropriate considering audiences are in mind that we may not have control of you know we wouldn't want a six-year-old having exposure to some sorts of content and and pertaining to genitalia but then it kind of gets meshed as being covered up as a secret dirty thing that mm -hmm. you know we can't ever discuss and so it's like how do you raise awareness about this how do you get the message out that this exists um that's definitely one of the challenges in pelvic health yeah, I would say, I would imagine, especially um, for anyone that's listening to this or will listen to this, I imagine that they're like, 
pelvic health. What? Mm -hmm. Which is like insane because then you go to, because people think that the time that you need the help is like, if, if you are peeing on yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not something necessarily that you think about, but then you did mention the, the sexual health aspect of it. And I think I feel actually kind of really strong about the topic of this amongst women because we don't talk about the only time that you hear about a woman having sex is when she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. That's like that's like the indicator when you walk around that you had sex because you're pregnant. Like it happened. You did the thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So it's like I, I think that's the only out loud conversation. And even amongst different women in my own life where maybe they they do feel uncomfortable maybe and and a lot of that stems right from we have been taught that this is this dirty little secret right um and so a lot of people don't feel comfortable even bringing it to their doctor because then they're like oh they're 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 gonna think I'm crazy bringing this conversation up so what is something that you do with your patients when they come to see you, right? Like, have they seen another doctor by the time they see you? Or how does this, I, I want to ask like all the questions, but how do you kind of make someone comfortable um, when they first start to see you or they come to see you in this kind of atmosphere? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, uh, the majority of women, probably 90% of them, vast majority have seen multiple providers for the issue that they're having. I am usually like a last ditch hope. I'm hoping you can help me. And, and, you know, really at a point where there's just really little faith that what they're experiencing can be improved at this point um, because they've tried all the things they could Google and perhaps their doctors were not the most helpful or a lot of times I've seen women have medical trauma happen to them Mm. um, as a result of lack of awareness in these spaces. And so, you know, the kind of approach I take to healthcare and how I work with my patients is centered in in being trauma informed. And so realizing that the average woman that comes in, the majority of women that come in have experienced trauma in some shape. And a lot of it is medical trauma and really modeling the kind of care um, that we hope to like integrate into our well being. So setting really clear boundaries about what expectations are, how things should be happening, um, communicating very clearly, and making sure that both parties are on the same page, but then also having kind of our backup plans of, hey, what do we do when one of us is uncomfortable? Um, do we need to just stop? Do we need to pause and take a break? Um, kind of walking people through that model of care so that they can go ahead and model that in their own relationships, you know, either with a significant other or other medical providers and really setting that standard. Um, because, I mean, sexual health is something that is a whole topic we could dive into Mm -hmm. but really seeing that lack of awareness of like how do we initiate conversations around sex like what does that even look like what is the aftercare of that so another question we don't have like when you leave your appointment and someone has examined a very private and personal part of you how do you make sure you're okay how do we Mm -hmm. check for that um just like when you are having an encounter with a partner or another provider how do you how do you end that and be okay and move on from it so that's kind of my approach um how I walk through with my patients and it looks so different whether I have you know a CrossFit athlete who just wants to do box jumps without peeing or um or if I have like a 20 year old that just got married and she can't consummate her marriage because there nothing can go in, there's too much pain. Um, so it looks so different, but still just modeling that care of like, how do we set boundaries for ourselves? I think that's so powerful what you just said, because I've in the last 10 years, I found myself going, first of all, going only to female doctors because who's going to, who's going to tell me, or who am I going to at least relate a little bit to more than someone who is also female, but also the conversation of going 
to a medical provider and feeling that comfortability. I think we forget that as doctors, we work together, not so much like you are the doctor and I'm the patient, right? Like I'm coming to you because I need help and you're in a position to help me. And so it, I used to feel like going to the doctor was like, all right, I got to like, you know, make sure I'm my P's and Q's here because I'm going to the doctor and they're going to, I don't want them to see, or I don't want them to know that like, I didn't have as many vegetables this year or whatever, like that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's really like, no, you're going to the doctor because you want to make sure you're healthy. But also if you're not, you want someone who's going to know, or at least be in the position to help you to know that you can be comfortable and also we can find help for you. And I think it's so powerful to kind of take our generation and restructure that mentality of going to the doctor because I mean, I don't, I don't know that you've felt this way, but I have where I'm like, they just want to make money off of me. Like they, you know, they just want to get paid. They want to make their, and they have to like doctors got to make money. Everyone has to make money, but I got to go to this visit and they're going to see me for two minutes and then send me on my way and I'm not going to feel any better. So I think it's so powerful that you're in this very unique space but you're also like yeah I think we should tailor this to be comfortable to whatever comfortable means to everyone because we don't again we don't think about it until it's you right you don't think about Mm -hmm. kind of what's going on until it's totally affecting you so on behalf of your current past and future patients that is awesome what you're doing as far as making sure everyone is comfortable. Thank you. So what is something what is something that you would want coming into the space that you would have wanted to maybe know or you want someone else to know whether I'm going to say as a patient but also on the medical side because we we did touch a little bit on really kind of how underserved this this part of the medical community is in this country. Um, What is something that you would want to maybe have told yourself or tell your future patients so that they can, whether it is begin the journey or feel comfortable where they are, just like an overall level? Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest things is continuing to have the energy to find the provider that's right for you. And that is really something big to ask of people because we do have the expectation of like, hey, you have the credentials, you have the the licensing, the board certifications, whatever. I should be able to just show up and you take care of me. Uh, But I think the biggest thing I've learned over time is like the providers are still just human beings. Like they can have all the Mm -hmm. credentials in the world. They can be very book smart, but they're still very subject to their own internal biases. And so sometimes it's just not a fit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So being able to keep up that hope of finding um, the person that's right for you, asking the questions and, and having the confidence to leave when you're not getting results or when you're no longer comfortable um, or when you feel like you said, like, they're just trying to make money off of me, which, which unfortunately is a big experience in our healthcare system. Um, It's so challenging to navigate and, you know, having navigated that as a patient myself, but then also as an employee working for healthcare companies and then having kind of my own healthcare company. I mean, it is dense and it is so thick to navigate. There's so many layers to this. Um, But keeping up that hope of finding like your person is out there. And that's kind of one of the cool things about um, practicing as an individual in the times that we are now where you can kind of put your presence out there. Like this is who I am as a human being. And yes, I happen to be able to take care of you as well um, to kind of help people really be able to connect to who they need to be seen by. Um, So just keeping that up because there are some amazing providers out there um, that are just really rocking the world and coming up with some great stuff. And then we have the providers that are not so good um, Mm -hmm. in these spaces that are kind of just ruining it and making it 
feel hopeless, but it's just a human being. And there's so many people out there. That's so, I think that's really so true, right? Because I can, I can kind of compare it to, is that Sorry. a little baby? Hello. It's okay. <laughs> my two-year-old who. I'm actually surprised my cat hasn't come to, hello. Hi. 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 Okay, go ask your dad and close my door. <laughs> I guess uh, get used to little ones walking in into our conversation. So I don't have children yet, um, but I have I have two cats and my boy cat makes very frequent um, appearances on the podcast. Uh, um, everyone knows him <laughs> as Benji and he he will let me prepare for an episode and he just he, it's his world we just live in it so that's why I was like oh it's okay <laughs> hi <laughs> um, I love it. so I was saying before that I can kind of compare about finding the right provider I can kind of compare that to like your favorite grocery store like it probably took you a while to go to that store or maybe you get about 90% of what you need at that store, but you still go to like a Trader Joe's or just a smaller store because, you know, they have the things that you need. And I think that that's the supermarket approach. I think it's very important to understand that it takes a little bit of time to find a good doctor that fits for you, but also understanding that sometimes those things change, you know, just as you change some doctors change down the line. So I think it's important to say that to not lose that hope of finding the right um, doctor or the right provider. So kind of going into the direction of how you got into your profession, how you are enjoying it, where do you see yourself in, in the coming years are you doing exactly what you're doing now? I mean, I know that's hard to say in, in the medical field because there's so many advances with science, but what, where do you want to kind of take your practice going forward or maybe sometime down the line? Like what's like the dream or like a goal for you? That is a fabulous question that I feel like I revisit every day. Um, <laughs> there was a time where I thought I was going to have like this huge clinic and all these clinicians. Um, and then to have since kind of pulled out of that, like, I don't know that my vision is to grow wide in that way. Um, but I do like the idea of giving to the community a little bit more. So putting in into place just workshops and getting the word out there is kind of the next step for me. Um, I, it's it's so ch pelvic floor therapy is so challenged because nobody knows what this is so how can you help people that just have zero awareness and just seeing like the effort that has to come it's you just have to be in the community spaces and so that's kind of the, ne the next direction for me I would like the community in my area in Texas to know like hey if I have this issue who are the people that I can go to to help so you know, being in the gyms, being at the birth centers, being at the women's clinics, just all the spaces where we exist to just give along the information and help the community as a whole be better. Um, because I just see when, when women do well, the community just thrives. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the coolest thing to experience. Um, I'm blessed enough to work with some just really amazing people. I mean, women from all industries, tech and, and healthcare and just all over the place, engineers. It's so cool. But when they are feeling well and connected and, and just in their bodies and experiencing life the way they want to, to it's just amazing what they're able to put out into the world. Um, so just spreading the public health info is still the mission for now. I love that. I think I think that's a great mission because I I can tell you if there's me and nine other women, I'm pretty sure that nine of them have not heard about public health. They have no idea. And of those nine women, at least five or six of them are 
moms, you know. <laughs> yes, Hello. you say moms and my little one's asking me for help. Go get your dad. Yes? Yes. All right. <laughs> but this is what, yes. th this is just a prime example though, right? Like you were just saying, you know, we thrive as women when we're in a community and here we are, we're having this conversation and you're still killing it in your space. You know, your baby comes in and he's like, Hey, X, Y, Z. And you're like, yep, great. And you keep going. And it, I think that's so powerful to say that in the mission that you're looking to achieve and, and what it is that you're doing, which I think is phenomenal. And I can't wait to like pick your brain, even if it's all the way from New Jersey, because I'm like, I have so many questions. Um, so speaking of questions, I do have a question um, because you mentioned being in, in the different birth centers and things like that. Is It isn't something that I know. Is physical therapy specifically for um, pelvic health, is that something that is offered to women now? Like once they give birth, is that part of that? Obviously, you can tell I haven't had a baby because I have no idea. <laughs> but is that part of that? You know how they have like the different uh, wellness checkups and things like that for kids once a, a mom has given birth. Is that part of the mom's care now or is it even offered or is it just like an elective? Yeah, um, I, I wish it was offered. I wish it was just as routine as the ultrasounds. So we probably know someone that's been pregnant and oh, I'm getting my ultrasound today. Like it's not something that you have to request. It's something that's so routine that, you know, we all kind of know about it. Um, and I mean, you always have the option to decline an ultrasound because there are some that have their reasons for not wanting that, but um, you kind of have to be in the know. Um, I've been doing pelvic health for, let's see, almost eight years now and wow. really seeing that it's shifting. So <laughs> it's not as quiet as it used to be. Um, there are some spaces that do refer, but I can say, you know, just as an example, in 2020, beginning of 2023, there's a local hospital that's less than a mile from my practice. And there are um, 12 OBGYNs that office there. And two of the 12 will refer out to pelvic floor therapy. I don't usually get referrals from any of the other ones. And even still, it's something that was prompted by the patient. So when they come in, they're like, yeah, we've tried this, this, and this. And I asked her if, if I could come see you, kind of a referral. Wow. Um, yes. And, and we look at other countries. I think France is the biggest example right now where it's just standard of care. You don't have to ask for it. It's just presented to you. You know that, you know, during pregnancy it's offered. And after you have your baby, there's going to be a physical therapist showing you how to get the stroller in the car, how to stretch your back after you breastfeed. Just, it's just standard care. Everybody gets it. Um, I know they have a lot more social funding for it. Um, so it's not, doesn't have as many barriers as it does here in the U.S. But mm -hmm. yeah, there there are some women in other countries that don't have to ask for it. Um, but here, I mean, it's it's not super common that providers even fully understand what pelvic floor therapy's role is, especially when we don't even know what the clitoris is yet. <laughs> oh man, I, I'm still like blown away at that because the you would think that that would have been one of the first at least dissected or something like to figure it out but <laughs> whatever that's probably a topic within itself um wow so again I know in the last like two or three months I know two women in my life that have given birth both to their second child and I'm very interested actually, and I'll, and I'll get back to you on this, to ask them if they've been presented to this, if it's something they're aware of, you know, that kind of a conversation, because I haven't, I haven't heard them say anything about it, but I also have never really heard anyone that I know presently that has had a, a baby or is in the process of having a baby that has had this conversation. So it is very interesting to 
to know how different we are from other countries. Yeah, I, I think we'll get there eventually. Um, I think that physical therapy has the luxury of time with patients because like you said earlier, it's like a two minute visit in the office, out the office, and I had to wait, you know, 45 minutes before y'all even called me back. And it was this medical tech that was with me taking my blood pressure half the time. And yeah, um, physical therapy really usually has the luxury of time with patients to really hear these stories that there typically isn't space and time for. Um, so I think, I think it's going to get there. I think the physicians that are able to really utilize it as part of like a comprehensive plan for a patient start to really lean into it because it's like, you know what, I'm going to tell you these di- the, these foods are harming for you, but then let's set you up with a support system to check in like, Hey, so why are you still drinking diet Cokes every day when you're yeah. eating like, okay, you're stressed. Let's talk about, you know, really being able to not just doctor at people, but hear their stories and, and get them the care that you need. Um, I know like in the orthopedic setting, you know, I think of like a shoulder injury. We see that a lot of the surgeons are so excited about physical therapy. Like, yeah, go see them, get your range. We're going to do the surgery. And I love that they even like, we'll call the physical therapy office. Like, have they made it to hundred degrees yet? Like, can they raise their arm. And I think we're going to get there, you know, with our OBGYN communities, our urologists, our our GI doctors. Um, I think it's coming the more that we're just here and showing, you know, every woman that has that story of this has helped me, please send your patients that way. And (laughs) we're seeing it grow. Well, that's, that's really great because we're still in the, in the very, beginning I think in you and your career and what it is that you're bringing forward in the in the medical community but also all of us you know most of the women that I know relatively were in the same ages where whether it's 10 years younger or 10 years older we're all in the same kind of 20 year span of still figuring our bodies out, which who would have thought that we would go from being teenagers to still not knowing what's going on with our bodies. So that's amazing to see. But at the same time, it gives me a lot of hope because, you know, down the line with my own nieces or my own, you know, my close friends, just having those conversations and and saying like, look, I'm not, I don't, you don't need to talk about it, but if I just want to plant this seed or just making those conversations more normal, right? Because, I'm sure anything that we feel is now normal probably didn't start out that way. Like, like breast cancer, you know, it might've been a, a conversation of like, Oh no, like how do you get breast cancer? And like those kinds of things. So I think it's great that you still have that hope and that you've shared that hope with me because I'm like, okay, great. So we're not, we're not all doom and gloom here. We are looking forward to some kind of, advancement. So I think that's great. So thank you for sharing that. And just to kind of wind down a little bit, I do want to say or ask, I should say, when you started out in, I'm going to say your after undergrad, did you think that you would end up where you are now? as far as this beautiful space, this unique space. Um, I'm sure you're probably going to say no, but you're, you might surprise me and say, yeah, I thought I was going to, you know, rock it. So did you see yourself going in this direction where you wanted to like zero in um, and helping women or did it just kind of come from a seed? Yeah, I had no idea this even existed. (laughs) (laughs) I did not know what pelvic floor therapy was. I very much, I was very vocal that I did not want to have a private practice because it just sounded like too much work. And it is a lot of work. (laughs) I was like, that is not for me. I just want to clock in and clock out every day. And um, not at all, but I, here I am. (laughs) I was so challenged with working 
as a healthcare employee, um, it, it, it was burning me out is what was happening. It, it was yeah. stressful. I was so ill. I was so sick because of just the stresses and, you know, healthcare is a business in the U S and so working in somebody else's business, making them money, but it was just eating away at me. I had all this information and knowledge and ideas about how to help patients, but it was always about the bottom dollar it felt like and just get them out. And it just felt so inauthentic to my soul to not be able to genuinely help people. Um, So I still am making my peace with private practice. It definitely has its challenges because your practice will not survive if you do not learn how business works and how to Mm -hmm. run a business which was not my um, expectation with getting into this. But I will say that there is this weird space where the two marry together so nicely, because if you do right by your people, your practice will thrive. There are some business concepts that line up so nicely with patient care. Like we have to be listening to what our consumer wants which is what providers should be doing for their patients. Yeah. Anyways, um, so it's definitely challenged me and changed me. I never in a million years wanted to be a practice <laughs> owner, but I'm grateful for my journey and, and what I've learned along the way, what I found. Um, it's been remarkable and here I am. <laughs> well, I do want to say thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for coming on tonight for sharing your experience for giving us the heat giving us the knowledge you know it's I know that this is just the beginning I feel like we're going to revisit this conversation um and hopefully it may be in person you know I might come down to Texas and we can kind of do this in person I would absolutely (laughs) love that but I, I just want to say truthfully, thank you for just opening up this space, you know, Absolutely. opening up the space to women listening to anyone listening, really, because ultimately we all have someone in our life who's going to prosper from this conversation. But also, thank you for doing what you do. You know, I know that usually most people that I've ever connected with when it comes to having their own practice, whenever they finally do it, they're like, I never thought I'd do this. I was so against this. I didn't want to do it. And those are the people that thrive. So I do want to say thank you for sharing today. Thank you for being vulnerable and putting yourself in that space. But also thank you for doing what you do. Because even though maybe not necessarily directly to me, because we are in different spaces, you are, you're doing a lot of work that means a lot. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And I am (laughs) so grateful for you having me. You've been such a wonderful host. Thank you. Thank you so much.